this is a, a collection of work from a postdoc that I did a few years ago, which is kind of still ongoing, as these things are, um, but with Andy Purvis, who was then at Imperial College London, now at the Natural History Museum in London, Paul Pearson and Tracy Ayes at Cardiff University. And so we kind of come together as one of these classic uh, interdisciplinary ideals. Um, and it was a really exciting time, a really great thing to be a part of. This is a classic uh, lineage through time plot, so log scale on the y-axis, time towards the recent, on the x, of reconstructed diversity. This is a classical phylogenetic molecular reconstruction of the world. You have a number of species at a point in time, and that decreases monotonically back in time. There's no extinction in this. This is the idealized scenario of that. All of these speciation events are dated perfectly, and they're dated perfectly because these are planktic foraminifera, and we know a lot about their fossil record. If we include their fossil record, though, we get a very different diversity curve. It's hard to join these gaps. It's hard to generate a model that comes down through here that actually represents this process. And actually, the red line, the reconstructed line, is a best case scenario. The reality is incomplete molecular sampling, a lack of fossil uh, constraints to the diversification dates, and so a lot of uncertainty in our diversification estimates. These are the yellow line is, the, is a median based on the uh, based on reconstructed, unconstrained molecular phylogenies. So typically what we're doing is not going from the red to the blue, we're going from the yellow. That's a really boring process. There's no, there's no changes in time through here, really. It's just exponential increasing to the blue, which is clearly much more interesting. There's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. So the, here's the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Here's the Eocene-Oligocene transition, formation of ice sheets on Antarctica, formation of an Antarctic circumpolar current, and so on. So what kind of model can get us from here to here? Uh, Sepkowski, in a seminal series of papers in paleobiology in 1978, uh, talked about a ca taxonomic carrying capacity. And so he was looking at the number of orders as opposed to species uh, and plotted this line showing an exponential increase to some limit. And carrying capacity comes from population ecology. So the idea that the number of individuals that can persist in a space is resource limited. And that logic extends from resource limitation to niche limitation. There's only a certain number of ways of living in the world. The world is a finite place. Therefore, there should be a finite number of species. Uh, Sepkowski argued that rather than a deterministic model, some kind of stochastic model is more realistic given the vagaries of geological preservation, given the vagaries of climate change. What we want to do is find out how that stochasticity, how that randomness is generated. And is it truly random, so a neutral process, or is it driven by some kind of biotic competitive component? The challenge is that the geological record is notoriously incomplete. So this is Shannon Peters' 2005 PNAS paper. S by section here, he means uh, rock formations. So fo fossiliferous rock formations. Can, do we find some rock that contains these types of fossils? And these are marine, these are marine uh, shallow water marine genera. Um, so, and the tight, well, so slightly looser, but slightly tighter correlations, particularly for when rock stops being deposited and stop, rock stops becoming sediment that we can record, that's tightly correlated with when we estimate that the genus goes extinct. So this is either a sampling bias because there's no more rock, we don't find any more species, or it's some third common cause. Some process is regulating both the sedimentation and the biology. And this is a problem going from the yellow 
to the blue lines because we would like a system in which we can just study the biology. And that biology is um, typically, or is exemplified, as this room knows, by microfossils, astonishingly complete fossil records. This is a, kind of, this, this is a first look at some micro-CT scanning work that I'm doing as part of my uh, Natural Environment Research Council Fellowship. You can, you can see the pores in this global, um, in this G. Sekulifer specimen. And you can, so you can go back through, through, through the development back into the middle. The, but their diversity, and this is Paul Pearson's image from some Tanzanian material. These are different species from Tanzania. They're all smaller than a millimeter across. Despite the constraints of being a unicellular organism, these things are actually quite diverse. They find a number of ways of going about their business, living, having an ecology. This is an example of how complete the fossil record is. This is Foot and Sepkowski's figure. So the proportion of living families with a fossil record, and the, but more, more interestingly, the probability that we find a species in a given bit of rock. So brachiopods have a, have a great fossil record, kind of up there about about 90%. But this is genera, whereas for planktonic foraminifera, this is species. This is, this, is, this is a higher level of resolution. This is getting towards species, the fundamental unit of diversification. And so we can, regardless of how, how we split up time, the average bin length here is about 11 million years as well. The average bin length here is 100,000 years. We find there's a 60% chance of detecting a species throughout its history. This is a capture mark recapture rate. And what this means is that we can ask questions, high resolution questions about the ecology. So we can move from diversity as just a clade to a diversity that lives at different parts of the ocean. So this, this is different depths we saw in, in the last talk, how we, you have those, intent, those density of individuals at different parts of the sediment. Here, the, these guys are living at different parts of the ocean, um, including some in up in upwelling zones and some in polar regions. But we also have different ways of living. So these are the three kind of feeding innovations that represent the ecology. So this is an Orbulina universa, uh, Howard Spiro's picture. Um, you can clearly see the, the test and then the, 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 the organism inside. But these dots on the outside are photosynthetic algal symbionts which get sent out on these spines each day to absorb energy, withdrawn back in at night, and so energy is consumed. They are an additional innovation on top of just the spines on their own. And then a third one, these keels. You can just see the keel on this menardellid on the bottom. The keel, much as on a boat, provides stability in the water column. So it means you can move to another part of the water column, escape the intense predation where you are. So these three innovations, and you, and you can see how they kind of have, have changed in dominance over time. This is, uh, this is symbionts, and up here is spines and symbionts. Um, you can see how these, the relative densities of these innovations has changed over time. As the environment changes, so does the dominant ecology. And we can look at that on the phylogeny. The colors, again, correspond to the different types. You see these bursts of diversification that correspond to the different types. It's not just that all these species don't have the same probability of going extinct or giving rise to descendant species, because they find a new way of living. And that new way of living has fitness advantages. And it's these ways of living that are, are the ecology. So, I don't want to talk too much about uh, species de delimitation because Friday will be an extended uh, discourse on that. Um, but we'll just zoom through some things. 
that I think are important in terms of understanding how species ecology drives macroevolution, because that requires us to define what we mean by species. So, these are some Globa geronella siphonifera, um, and the striking thing about microfossils is that we can understand the variation in form. And by studying the variation, we can look at how the distribution changes through time. So I'm referring to Simpson's uh, evolutionary species concept, with, with which we're now all familiar. Um, a single line of descent, an ancestral descendant, sequence of populations evolving separately from others. This is, this is morphospace, this is a trait, and then this is time. And at different points in time, the, the morphology is different. But if this blue, this blue polygon represents the distribution of morphospace, space, there's no gaps here. This is a continuous distribution. There's no splitting into two forms. It's just that the whole thing is shifting by anagenesis. It's a microevolutionary view of change. If there was another blue bit that went off up here, then that, would be the, then, 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 then that would be speciation, because we'd have a species, we'd have a distribution here, a gap, and another distribution. We don't. The whole thing is shifting. So even though this is very different to this, the continuation is the key thing. And this matters. Uh, imagine this is a hypothetical model of morphospace occupation. Morphospecies, as we might use in stratigraphy, are defined by first appearance of a new form. So this first species alpha evolves at this point here at the first point at which we get to this form. Similarly, gamma 1 emerges at the first point that this new species forms. Gamma 2 and gamma 3. The difference to an evolutionary lineage is that the lineage is defined by the time that the gap appears. <coughs> same. So same species, but now we have this gap between the two forms. So we define that the evolutionary species has emerged. Because there's no gaps here, gamma 1, gamma 2, and gamma 3 are considered or to be pseudonyms of the same species. There's, no, there's, there's been no formation into multiple species. They're just multiple names to describe the same thing. And the date is when that first gap appears. These are budding speciation events, um, whereas we can also have the analogous bifurcating systems too. And what you note is that these different concepts, these different ideas of births and deaths, realize different numbers of species. And if we realize different numbers of species, we reconstruct different types of diversity curves. So we have a different role for how ecology drives macroevolution. This is a particular example. This is a lineage of um, planktic foraminifera. Um, this up the top is our point of interest, because this is a new genus. This is some higher, crucial, higher level of biological organization. This is the formation of a new genus, Sphoroidinella, particularly Sphoroidinella de Hissens, and it's marked by the appearance of secondary apertures on the reverse. It's a key zone fossil. It's really important for stratigraphy. It's the gap from the, from the Miocene to the Pliocene. And yet, because there's an integration of the previous Sphoroidinella anopsis pan de Hissens, it's not, a, it's, it's not a speciation event. It's not, a, it's not the origination of a, new, of a new genus. It occurs by anagenetic change, that drift, that change in morphology. There's no gap. The only speciation event here is for Sphoidinella and Anopsis cocci. And if we look at the extinction, the genus ends here of Sphoidinella and Anopsis without actually any extinction, because the lineage is still going. What's changed is the name. It's, a, it's an artifactual result. Mm 
the only species that dies out is Savoidnemonopsis cocci there. So what we end up with is what Stanley called pseudo-speciation and pseudo-extinction. <coughs> Stanley, uh, being American, was a great lover of baseball. I said, I've got no idea. Um, these, are, these are baseballs. And we know these are baseballs because we've studied them back through time. We know that this is an older baseball than this, and this is a newer baseball because the stitching has changed. But there's been no, there's been no creation of a new game here. There's been no formation of rounders or softball. This is all baseball. But as time has gone on, so the tools used to construct baseballs has changed. It doesn't mean that this isn't a baseball. A Plantic form example uh, from uh, Paul Pearson and Helen Coxall's paper that's in paleontology this week, um, but I only noticed on the plane yesterday that it was out, and I haven't got the full citation. I'm sorry. But the movie was put together by Catherine, Watt Catherine Watling's Minutiae project, which is online and absolutely fantastic. This is about a million, 1.2 million years of evolution through the Hank Canelia lineage. It starts off as a kind of rounded, kind of gnarly, perhaps rather unexciting form. But then it's go as it goes through time, it's evolving these tubulo spines. And each of these large tubulo spines has an aperture on the end, so it's, and, and they're hollow. So they're sucking in nutrients from the greenhouse oceans. When it first starts, not only does it not have those tubular spines, it can't construct these things with the requisite geometric efficiency. It's trying to do it. When we spin back, we'll look again. So here it's starting. No hollow tips. They become extended. And then you begin to see the start, the kind of nodules starting to form. They can't quite get them going out straight, though. They haven't got the geometric thing sorted. But after about a million years, you get a very elegant, ornate, and geometrically efficient form. That's very different from that. But there's been no splitting. There's been no gap. It's anagenesis. An example that I'll just zoom through, uh, because that's, there's artistic license in the creation of a movie. This is a, how we can do this in principle. So uh, Paul Pearson and master students measured 10,200 of these tur turbo retalids. This is, this is a pin for scale. Um, we can step through a number of automated steps to infer how many species there are. We don't want to say that species A and that species B. We want that pattern to come from the data. And so we devised a protocol by which we put the data in and step through a number of reasonable ways in which we can say, OK, this is the structure. I'm going to talk more about that on Friday, so I won't do a lot about it now, except to say we can do it. And rather than the uh, between 8 and 11 morpha species that people argue about, we reckon there's one lineage up to about 36 and a half million years ago in the late Eocene, and then we see these two successive, well-separated, in statistical way, well-separated forms that persist in the same parts of morpha space for a million or so years until the Eocene Oligocene transition and the world changes. We descend into our ice house world. The, the great thing, or well, there's, there's loads of great things about microfossils. But the, one of the great things is you can keep them, you can do big data science and keep it in, on your desk. These are the individuals at the middles of all of the clusters. Only I've removed some clusters so they fit on this slide. So we start off again, rounded, globular, not, not particularly elegant. As we kind of come through time, everything is getting more more structured, more triangular. We can see this, sh this sharp edge here. And then the split occurs. And these things are much, um, are much more, much, much sharper down this edge and with a much more pronounced bottom than they were at the start. But the, the, the daughter species is more compressed. It has a clearer keel. The aperture is a different size. We can, by eye, these two things look different. But the eye hasn't been used in delimiting them. It's stepped through in a series of algorithmic steps. 
the definition matters. How we, how we think of a species matters because under a number of different concepts, how what we model clade growth, diversification, macroevolution to be changes. So the squares here are evolutionary species and the circles are morphous species. And the open, so the open symbols are bifurcating. That is, as you get to a speciation event, that species goes extinct and two new ones form. The solid symbols can have persistent ancestry through the speciation event. You get a bud coming off. This, 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 this performs quite nicely. The bifurcate and this, the morpho species performs okay. The bifurcating morpho species is a couple of orders of magnitude out. How we define species, what we mean by a species concept, has a fundamental consequences for any model. And so we can come to the meat of the talk. Lee Van Valen in 1973 introduced the concept of in, introduced the metaphor of the Red Queen model of evolution. It takes all the evolving you can do just to keep your place in the order of life. It's a biotic view of the world. It's driven by organismal interactions. It's about ecology. And evolutionary biologists and evolutionary ecologists like this model. It's clear that our interactions have a role, and this model encompasses them. Paleontologists are less keen because, or traditionally, because paleontologists typically don't have that same resolution. They're working with genera, they're looking at 11 million year bins. They don't have these reconstructed ecosystems. What they do have is time, and time gives you things like meteor impacts, massive ocean acidification events, these huge perturbations to the system that leave a clear signal. This is, and uh, Tony Barnowski in 2001 coined the phrase the court jester uh, to kind of be similar language to the Red Queen, to represent an environmental, an abiotic view of the world, one in which organismal interactions are an inconvenience but can be, can be assumed away as being neutral. What really matters is whether a dinosaur crashes into Mexico, destroys a dinosaur, causes the extinction of the dinosaurs. And Mike Benton in the 2009 uh, science special issue on 150 years of Darwin, um, or 150 years of on the origin of species rather, talked about how these two hypotheses shouldn't be mutually exclusive. There's clearly a role of the abiotic in regulating the biotic. The organisms clearly respond to their environment. The notion that we should have this caricature in two places is unhelpful. That was a verbal argument. And so we set out to test that uh, using models. And we used a model from population biology. This is uh, Alfred Locker's integral equation for population growth. It's a continuous time model because this is the kind of data that we're looking at. These are ocean cores. Um, it is hard to know how you would discretize <coughs> this sedimentation into meaningful bins. If you're studying uh, great tip population dynamics, you have bursts of reproduction in spring. You have, you have the, the, the hatching season in temperate zones when all the young are born. And then uh, nothing happens from population dynamic. There's some, there's some migration and some death. But there's no more reproduction until the next spring. We typically collect that data in these short bursts. You go out and you look in nest boxes. That system discretizes well. This with all these mixed generations and no obvious differences. So this is the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. Um, so you go from a very 
it's a sudden in introdu introduction of anoxin, of an um, a sudden introduction of acidification in in into the water column. You, you, you can see stuff like that, but generally, background change is hard to pick out. We want a continuous model for this. And R is our population growth rate. I'm just going to step through what these parameters mean. So R is what we're looking for, population growth or diversification of the clade. We're going to look across a, a load of different species ages up to the maximum species age. And this means we can test Van Balen's law of constant extinction risk with age. We then want births and deaths, speciations and extinctions. And they're going to be dependent on a state, alpha. And that state is defined by the number of competing species and the climate, by which I mean the oxygen isotope record, which is a proxy for temperature and ice sheet volume. How do we get at these functions by looking at durations. So this is a cartoon. <coughs> We've got two extinctions here. One, two. But because, ex because death is a binary process, you're either alive or you're dead, we know something about the probability of extinction from studying all these guys. Even though this, this one hasn't gone extinct, that tells us something about the probability of going extinct. It's like an experiment when you expose rats to poison. If the rat survives the experiment, you know something about that rat's susceptibility to that poison. Similarly, speciation events. Got three speciation events, but we know something from these other two about the probability of speciation. set up a series of differential equations, one which regulates the, your survival, S, and assume as a starting condition that the instant you are born, you are alive. You have no chance of death in the instant you are born. Then do births, so speciations, and assume that the instant you are born, you cannot produce a, a daughter species. You have to assume, speciation takes time. That's why we study it in the, in the, in the fossil record. It's why we can't study it in, in modern systems effectively. You, need, you cannot give rise to a speciation, to, to a daughter species immediately. It takes a certain number of generations. And assume that there are a load of different types. This is our ecology. These are our different feeding innovations. We've got, on the main diagonal, the chance that your daughter species is the same type as you. And on the off diagonal, we've got the probability that your daughter species is some kind of mutant, some kind of different feeding innovation, some different way of life. Because Ivory models as hypotheses, you set up a series of models which set a series of hypotheses, define a number of models that look at either Red Queen on its own, so this is our ecology, our biotic, our organismal, look at Court Jester on its own, so this is uh, paleontology, abiotic, uh, environmental, and then look at them additively together, and then look at their interaction. And then you identify the support for each of these by comparing the full model, which is this one with everything in, to each of the particular models. So if we want to know the role of the court jester, we take the full model and subtract the amount of variance explained by the Red Queen. So what's left over is just the court jester. Similarly, if we want to know about the Red Queen, look at, look, look at the full model. How much of this 
4.8 is explained by the court jester. What's left must be explained by the Red Queen in this setup. Plot them as bars, because that's easier to see. And we get support for court jester of, uh, what's that, 0.16, the Red Queen 0.29, and the, their interaction 0 0.07. So there's most support in this toy example for the Red Queen. We can in, so we're embedding these, embedding these questions in a quantitative way. Let's look at the real data. So the first thing to say is that I'm not looking at R squared anymore. R squared is the proportion of variance explained by the model. I'm looking at the difference in Aikiki information criterion corrected for small sample size. And this is important because some of these states have different numbers of parameters in them. And what AIC does is tells us is the measure of variance explained with an offset for the number of parameters used. We, if something is a key driver, it explains a lot of variance with very few parameters. This is speciation. And we've got competition, which is D for diversity, affects speciation more than climate. So we've got that, that, that distinction there. This horizontal dashed line kind of corresponds, is a, AI, is a difference of AIC scores of two. So anything beneath this line is not a significant effect. Anything above that line is a significant effect. And the importance of paleo data is because, or one of the importances of paleo data, is because the patterns between speciation and extinction are not the same. So for extinction, climate is more influential than biotic competition. So let's think about the dinosaurs. Meteor comes down. It's nothing to do with how many competitors you've got. It's driven entirely by this external rock falling from the sky. Whereas if you want to find a new way of existing in the world, you need to find a niche. And that niche is regulated more by the number of competitors than it is by the environment. So, different, so they've got different, different components on each side of the births and deaths. We find evidence for age-specific speciation extinction. So this is rejecting Van Valen's law of constant extinction. This is suggesting a burst of diversification. The youngest species are most likely to give rise to descendant species. We'll come back to that. But now let's, let's put in the ecology and then the interact. So these, these are our different depth habitats and our different feeding morphologies. So the spines and the keels and the symbionts. And let's look at how those different types of feeding innovations interact with the environment and with the overall number of species present. And clearly, this is having a large role on these dynamics. So this is the different types of species respond differently to climate change. If you have the same climate driver, not all individuals respond in the same way to it. And let's look at that. These are hazards, so kind of probabilities. So this is the probability of extinction and the probability of speciation. And the key thing to note, going from a greenhouse ocean, so this is uh, 34 to 65 million years ago, no ice sheets on Antarctica, no ice sheets in the Arctic, uh, no circumpolar Arctic current, uh, less mixing in the ocean, very different world to our modern ice house world that has all those things. And the key thing to note is that the lines swap over. So green is keels. Keels have the highest extinction risk in a greenhouse ocean, but the middle extinction risk in an ice house ocean. Look at, look at speciation. These are, are uh, symbionts and spines. They're at the top in the, in the greenhouse ocean. They're most likely to speciate in a greenhouse ocean. Sorry, this, that's just, just symbionts on its own. Symbionts have the highest probability of speciating in a greenhouse ocean, but then only second in an ice house ocean, because then you want to have symbionts and spines, which go from third in the greenhouse to first in the ice house. You change just a coarse environmental proxy. It's just one top-down driver 
You change the response of the ecosystem to it. Not all species are the same. And that, that reminds us of our split diversity curve. We see these are keels and symbionts. They, they only exist in this greenhouse world. Whereas spines and symbionts, they're only existing in, the, in this modern ice house world. Different oceans, different types of species. There's no obvious equilibrium here. The system isn't moving towards some equilibrium state. It's responding, it's feeding back, it's moving through a series of ongoing transients. And we can see this in other systems too. This is a paper by Meng and McKenna in 1998 in Nature, looking at paleogene mammal turnover in Tibet. Sample sizes at the top, so a much smaller, coarser study than for the planktic formants, but same time scale. Eocene, Oligocene, moving through that transition from greenhouse to ice house, large turnover in the dominant species. Look at a large scale at the paleobiology database. This is uh, Jessica Bloy's uh, review in science last year. Really deep time now, okay, going back hundreds of millions of years. But same, same thing. We could look at dominant species deep in time are not dominant recently. The dominant recent fauna are different because they're responding to a different set of environmental challenges. There is no optimal ecology for all of the history of life because the abiotic conditions for that life change. And so we can view, so how does species ecology drive macroevolution? Well, according to this model, we have these two top-down forcings. One is biotic competition, that's the red queen. Another is climate, that's the court jester. Those two top-down factors get filtered by our different types, our different ecologies. And that filtering process gives rise to speciation and extinction probabilities that together generate diversification. And that's our R from our model. That's the final thing we've been looking for. And so that's now here on the z-axis. As we see diversity increasing, we're seeing that fall. Well, there's this, this, is a, this is clear evidence for some, some kind of a limit to the number of species on Earth. The, the, can, the can capacity is, a, is about at this point, even though there's not ticks on here. But it also depends on climate. So this is going from low to high, from greenhouse to ice house. And what we see is that you, you, you have these two peaks. You, you, you have a system that deals with the greenhouse situation, has high diversification in the, in the greenhouse. And you have a system that has high diversification in the ice house. And the position along there changes. And it's this interaction which emerges from the model. It emerges from studying the lower level speciation, extinction, and ecologies. And that gives us what we see in the macroevolutionary dynamics with this clade. And so if we want to do it, if we want to make this step across these scales of understanding, we need to start at one and move up to another and do it in some kind of coherent framework. Thank you very much. Thank you.